Okay, so we're moving on to section 6.3, which is entitled General Probability Rules. And really, after a ton of information in section 6.2, there's way less information in section 6.3, really what we're going to focus on here is just this fifth way to solve probability problems. We spent a lot of time on the first four, um, and really all we're going to do here is we're going to go into a little more depth on some of the rules of probability. Um, and kind of as a little preview, remember we had those kind of conditions where certain rules only apply to certain things were true. Now we're going to kind of talk about those issues. Um, so let's get let's get right to it. So you remember that actually, and we talked about the rules of probability. The third rule of probability was something I called the addition rule, and that was the probability of a that's the or b is equal to the probability of a plus the probability of b. At the time, I made the condition that this only applies if A and B are disjoint. So now we're going to talk about, well, what if they're not disjoint? Okay? And so this is why we're going to have something we're going to call the general addition rule. So this is the, I'm calling it 3A, but this is a rule that applies whether or not they are disjoint. And the general addition rule is the probability of A or B is the probability of A plus the probability of B, and here's the new part, minus the probability of A and B. Remember, the this means or, this means and. Now, you can kind of think about this. What's the probability of someone being, uh, you know, I don't know, taking French or being a junior? Well, you wouldn't just say it's the probability of taking French plus the probability of being a junior, because in some ways that's going to count certain people twice, right? Those juniors who are taking French are going to be included in here, and they're going to be included in here, which is why the general rule says we subtract out the uh, people who are taking both. Okay, And I think one good way, and remember the word disjoint means things that cannot happen at the same time. Are being a junior and taking French disjoint? Well, no, they can't happen at the same time, so they are not disjoint, which is why we can't use this up here. We have to subtract out the, the overlap. And a good way to think about this is with an example, and an, ex an example bizarrely involving a Venn diagram. So uh, here I've written this general addition rule up here again, and here's a silly example. In a town, 44% of kids play soccer, 35% of kids play basketball, and 12% play both. And we're going to find the probability of soccer or basketball. And first of all, I think we have to use this one because our soccer and basketball disjoint events well, no, because 12% of kids play both, so is the, they could happen at the same time. So I'm actually going to begin this one by actually drawing for you a Venn diagram. And you can kind of think about it. It's actually not too hard to draw the Venn diagram yourself. Let's do soccer here. This is basketball here. 12% do both. Well, the whole soccer bubble has to add up to 44%, so this has to be 32%. Uh, the uh, basketball bubble has to add up to 35%, so this is 23%. And you can figure out the outside would be, too. Uh, it's ended up being 44 plus 22, 20, let's see, 44, I can't do it in my head. There's some number out there, okay? So now let's kind of think about this formula. Well, what's the probability of doing soccer or basketball? Well, that's everybody in this whole kind of region right in here is soccer or basketball. But you wouldn't just want to say 44% plus 35% because that would include these 12% of kids twice. So using the formula up here, we would say the probability of this is 44 is for probability of playing soccer plus a basketball is 35. Uh, here's the thing, minus the 12%, right? And that's going to add up to, and that's 67%. So that's an example, and of course you could also, once you have the Venn diagram, it might be easier to say, well, heck, that's the same thing as 32 plus 12 plus 23 is another way to get 67%, okay? It's a good example, I think, actually, given the choice of doing it as a Venn diagram or applying this formula up here, I think most of us would just prefer to think about it this way, this plus this plus this, instead of saying something like, uh, you know, this plus this minus this, which is essentially what the formula is saying, okay? But that's a good example of a, uh, the general addition rule. Our next modification is something to the multiplication. Remember, the multiplication rule was rule number five, and it's the probability of A and B is the probability of A 
times, that's why it's called multiplication, the probability of B. And at the time I said this rule only applies if A and B are independent. Well now we're going to come up with a general multiplication rule that works whether or not A and B are independent. And here's the general multiplication rule. It's the probability of A and B is the probability of A times, and here's the new part, the probability of B given A. And remember this means, this symbol here means B given A. That's a conditional probability. It's the probability of B occurring given that A occurred. Um, and I think, that, again, the easiest way to think about this one is with an example. So let's go on to the next page. Okay, so here I wrote up at the top the general multiplication rule. And my example is in a grocery store, 70% of the grapes are green, 25% of the green grapes are seedless. And by the way, if the, if the grapes are not green, well, let's just say they're purple. So 70% of grapes are green and 30% are purple. So 25% of the green grapes are seedless, 40% of the purple grapes are seedless. And so we're going to find the probability of green and seedless. And I think the easiest way to think about this one is with a tree diagram, actually. So let's draw a tree diagram. Here's all of our grapes. We're going to go green and, I'll say not green, but really it could be purple. And then we're going to say seedless, and it's a little bit confusing because seedless complement would be seeded. Seedless, seeded complement. And now we can just write in some numbers. Well, we know 70% are green, so 30% has to go down here. Of the uh, green grapes, we know that 25% are seedless. This has to be 75% here. Okay? And then we know 40% goes here, and then obviously 60% is going to have to go here. And then kind of following our normal tree pattern, we will multiply out uh, the numbers. And there we go. So now I think about, we want to figure out what's the probability of being green and seedless. Well, the probability of being green, I'm going to use this formula up here again, the probability of being green is, let me change my pen color, is 0.7, right? Now with the probability of being seedless, this is probability of being seedless given that you are green. Well that's that number right there, that's what that number means. This number is the probability of being seedless given that you are green. So I'm going to write that number right there, and that is 0.175 or 17.5 percent. This number right here you can obtain by going probability of green and seedless. And just, I mean, so I think the tree diagram actually does this formula kind of intuitively. Um, but I think it's way easier to think about in a tree diagram than this kind of arcane formula because I think it's, it's obvious to us that right now that this number is 0.25, but it, it, sometimes symbolically it's a little bit trickier to see. Note, though, that you have to use that number. You wouldn't just say the probability of green times the probability of seedless because what's the probability of being seedless? Well, it's actually this number plus this number, and that's just not what you would do in the situation if you wanted to find this number. Okay, so it's a good example of the general multiplication rule. And just the last little thing to wrap up all of chapter six is I wanted to give you one new definition of a term we've talked about before, and it's a definition of the term disjoint. Okay, now just joint at the time I said it means the events cannot happen at the same time. But so now, actually, well, let's do it a little more symbolically. A and B are disjoint means the probability of A and B is zero. Again, think what that means. If they can't happen at the same time, then the probability of A and B, them happening at the same time, has to be zero. Okay? This is just a symbolic way to write what I wrote in section 6.1 in words. And now that we kind of have that, let's compare our addition rule and our general addition rule. Well, actually, it's called the general addition rule because it doesn't really matter if they're disjoint. Let's kind of think about what this means. Here's the general addition rule, right? Well, what if they are disjoint? What is this part right here? If they are disjoint, this part right here would be zero. And then you're basically back up to here. So it's called the general addition rule because you can always use it. And if it just turns out that they are disjoint, 
then this quantity would be zero, and then you're basically kind of defaulting back to the original uh, rule. Okay? And I hope that makes some sense. And a similar thing is going on. Let me give you a new definition of the term independent. Okay? At the time, I defined independent as one outcome does not influence another. Let's talk about that a little bit more symbolically. So A and B are independent means the probability of B given A is just the probability of B. In other words, if, whether, if you knew that A happened, it doesn't matter because it's just the probability of B happening, right? Think about you know, being blonde and taking Latin. Well, the probability of uh, taking Latin, given that you are blonde, is just the probability of taking Latin. In other words, being blonde doesn't matter. Okay? Latin people, people taking Latin, whether they're blonde or brunette or bald, it's just the probability of taking Latin. Okay? And again, we'll do a similar thing. Let's compare some formulas here. This was the addition, sorry, this was the multiplication formula. This is the general multiplication rule. So at first I wrote A and B is A, probability of A times probability of B, only if they are independent. Well, now think about this. We have a general one that says the only difference is this part right here. Well, what if they are independent? If they are independent, this part just becomes probability of B. In other words, A doesn't matter. And if they are independent, then basically you're back up to this formula. So actually, it's why this is called the general multiplication rule, because if they, you can always use it, and if it happens that the things are, that A and B are independent, well then B given A is just B, and then you kind of end up with this formula. That's why 3 and 5A will always work. Okay? And hopefully that kind of makes some sense. It's just a symbolic way of, this is just a symbolic way of kind of a term I gave you early on. And that really wraps up chapter 6.